ओके गाइस फाइनली अ वीडियो ऑन डेटा स्ट्रक्चर्स विद जावा स्क्रिप्ट इज हियर एंड इन टुडेज वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द टॉप फाइव मोस्ट आस्ड डीएसए क्वेश्चंस इन आवर फ्रंट एंड इंटरव्यूज व्हिच विल कवर कांसेप्ट्स लाइक अरे स्ट्रिंग रिकर्शन ऑब्जेक्ट्स एटसेट्रा वी विल फर्स्ट ट्राई टू कम अप विद अ ब्रूट फोर्स सॉल्यूशन एंड देन ट्राई टू ऑप्टिमाइज दीस प्रॉब्लम्स फॉर टाइम एंड स्पेस कॉम्प्लेक्सिटीज सो दैट वी कैन गिव आउट द ऑप्टिमल सॉल्यूशन ऑल राइट सो द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज पैलिंड्रोम नंबर now a lot of you might have already heard about this because it's, it's a very popular problem when it comes to data structures like very basic ground level data structures problem so what the question says is that we are given an integer which could be like 121 and we are supposed to tell if it's a palindrome number or not now what is a palindrome number so palindrome number is a number which reads exactly the same when you read it forward or backward so if this is 121 so if you you know reverse the number 1 2 1 so it's exactly the same as it was forward as well as backwards but that is not the case with 10 so if you read 10 it's 1 0 but if you read it in reverse manner it's 0 1 therefore in this case output will be false but in the first case output will be true so let's see how we can do this so i'm going to create a function over here const is palindrome function you can make it a normal function or you can arrow function as well doesn't really matter so i'm just going to assign an anonymous function to this and obviously we're going to take an input which can be x in this so now what are we supposed to do we are supposed to check if this number is exactly the same when it's reversed as well right so i'm going to say return x should be equal to x so what we're going to do we're going to reverse the number right so first of all we have this in this numerical format so what we want to do is we're going to convert it into a string first because because obviously we have inbuilt functions to reverse the string in javascript right so i'm going to say dot to string now this will convert this 1 to 1 that is i'm going to comment over here 1 to 1 to this string 1 to 1 right so first step is to convert it into a string now since we've converted it to a string we have access to a lot of inbuilt functions such as split now what does this split do now when you provide something in between of these braces so let's say i'm going to keep it empty so what it's going to do is it's going to find this particular thing in this string so in 121 this is just nothing right this is a normal cursor so it's going to split the string from over here let's say if you were to put 2 over here so what it will do is it will say it will convert it into an array with two things one comma one so it will split the string from this two but in our case we're not going to provide anything so it's going to just split the string from this cursor so in our case it's one two one an array like this after we have done this we have reached till this point so i'm going to put it right over here Okay cool so we have an array over here we are supposed to reverse this array right so we have an inbuilt function in javascript called reverse now as if i go on over here and so it says reverses the elements in an array in place what does in place means in place means it doesn't creates another array it's just reverses the existing array of this array so if we say it so obviously this looks exactly the same as it looks from forward and backward so it will look exactly the same even when reversed so if it was 10 it would have been converted into 01 instead of 10 by using this reverse function now after that we have reversed it successfully now we're going to join all of this string and convert it into a number so now i'm going to say join now you're also provide let's just like split you are supposed to provide from where like what are you going to use to join these like if i were to say i don't know dot so it would have been converted to something like this 1 dot 2 dot 1 a string obviously so it would have been joined like this but we're not going to provide this dot so it's going to be joined just like that and we have a string which is reversed now but our original x was a number right so now we have two options either we convert this into a string and then compare it with this or we can convert this into a number so what we're going to do we're going to simply put this plus operator over here what this does is it simply converts this string into a number if it's possible 
but let's say if it was a, if it was an a or b a string like that that's not possible to convert it into a number right so let's see what happens when we try to do that i'm just gonna console log this over here after commenting that out if i let's say plus and we if we have a string called a and i'm gonna open my terminal and i'll say node and the name of the file is one palindrome and i'm gonna run this oh obviously we're not calling this function so let's call this function over here i'm just gonna randomly provide it something it doesn't really matter in this case but it will it will matter later so i'm gonna run this and you're gonna see we get not a number but if this was let's say x i'm oh, sorry not x I'll, i'm gonna say 10. so if it was 10 then let's see what do we get i'm gonna run this again so we get 10 in the numeric format so that is what this plus helps us to do so yeah that's the console log and let's see i'm gonna store our result over here const result equals is palindrome and i think we should get either true or false with respect to like whatever we do over here so i'm gonna log res response over here and, and i'm providing one to one right now i'm gonna run this and we get true obviously because this is a palindrome string but if i were to provide 10 and then run this again we're gonna get false so this is how you identify if a number is palindrome or not. And this is a very ground level problem that the interviewer can ask you during the front end interviews. And this is usually asked from, you know, juniors or freshers, entry level developers. Now I'm going to take this problem and I'm going to go to lead code. But before moving forward in this video, I'm here to talk to you about a platform that has changed my life for better. TopMate. For the past six months, I've been using TopMate to help people land their dream job and have even earned six figures in the process. But the best part, getting to connect with you all and the satisfaction that comes with knowing that I'm making a difference in someone's life. And let me tell you about the platform itself. It's so easy to use and it's packed with features that make it simple to create, sell and connect with your audience. But here's the thing, TopMate isn't just for the creators like me. Whether you're an entrepreneur, expert, or an influencer, TopMate can help you elevate your online presence and turn your skills and expertise into income. You can offer customized one-on-one -on -one sessions, sell digital products, or host informative webinars. The possibilities are endless. So if you're looking for a platform that's easy to use, packed with features, and can help you take your online presence to the next level, I highly recommend checking out TopMate. TopMate. Elevate your online presence. Here we go. I have opened lead code over here. Let me just uh, zoom it a little bit. So I'm just going to provide it this solution and we're not going to need all of these. Yeah. So now, okay, I need to log in. Let me just quickly log in. Okay, here we go. I've logged in successfully and now I'm going to submit this. It's going to run all of the test cases, all the different test cases that are available in the platform. And here we go. The solution is accepted and it says it beats the 54.40% of the solutions. But let's try to improve this solution a little bit. So I'm going to go back to my VS code and I'm just going to add one condition over here. I'm just going to say if x is less than 0, then obviously if it's less than 0, then it's not a palindrome, right? Because it will have that minus with it. So if it's a minus 10, then obviously it's not going to be a palindrome string. If x is less than zero, I'm gonna return simply false so that it doesn't go to this operation over here and we can save some time for it. And you know what, instead of this, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make it one liner. Um, so I'll say return. If x is less than zero, then I'm gonna say false. Else it's going to do our original operation. Okay, let's copy it up and let's try to run this. And you can see our solution beats 83.93% of the solution. So that's a huge optimization. So as you must have noticed now how important the edge cases are. Even though your code is working absolutely fine, but if you add the edge cases for even the slightest conditions, it can optimize your code a lot sometimes. And also I'm gonna provide the link to all of these codes in the description down below. So you can check them out and refer to them. And also before moving forward, if you would like for me to make a complete data structure series, where I explain time complexity, space complexity first, then I move on to array, string, linked list, 
maps, graphs, and all of the data structures that can be used in JavaScript and you can expect in your front-end interviews, front-end or back-end interviews as well. Just let me know in the comments down below and I'll create a complete data structures with JavaScript series for you all. Now, the second question is Fibonacci number. Now, what is this Fibonacci number or Fibonacci series? So Fibonacci series looks something like this. What is this exactly? So let's say we have the first, so it basically starts with two numbers that is zero and one. So these are by default the starting uh, numbers, right? So if we have zero and one as the starting number, the third number will be the sum of both of these numbers, right? So let's say I'm gonna write over here. So zero comma one. Now the third number will be the sum of these numbers that is one plus zero. So it will be one obviously. Now the fourth number will be the sum of previous two numbers that is one plus one, it's going to be two. As so on like two plus one that is three and as you can see over here five, eight, thirteen and it goes to infinity. So in this question we're going to provide the input n equals three. Now it's going to go to this Fibonacci series and we're, we're supposed to calculate which is the number on third position in Fibonacci series. And obviously the series starts from zero, I mean the indexes start from zero. So it's going to be zero, one, two, Three. So this will be our output and it will give the output two over here. So if I were to say, let's now tell me what is going to be on number seven. So it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is 13 will be our output. So this is what we're supposed to implement over here. And as you can see, I've provided this uh, formula over here. Like if it's zero, then obviously we're going to give the zero if it's one. It's going to give the one because these two are by default, right? These are our edge cases. As I discussed in my previous question, we're going to handle that. Uh, apart from that, if we're supposed to provide f of n, so it should calculate by f n minus one and f n minus two, which is going to be this output over here, as I already explained. So let's jump into the code and see how we can do this problem. And this question as well is one of the most asked questions in our interviews because this is also expected from a beginner or a junior level developer to frame this logic. I'm going to create a function over here. Let's say fib and I'm going to give it an anonymous function and I'm going to take n as the input, right? Now we're going to discuss multiple different approaches for this. Let's start with a very simple one. So first of all, we're going to have two numbers as our starting point. So const array equals zero, oops, zero comma one, right? So we have this array with our starting two numbers of zero and one, right? Now we're going to initiate a for loop. It's going to start from two because obviously zero, let me get rid of this. It's going to start with two because obviously zero and one position we already know, right? So we're going to start with zero and it's going to go to i less than or equals to n and it's going to be i plus plus. Yeah, that's self-explanatory. Now what we're supposed to do, we're going to keep adding more numbers to this array as we go forward. So I'm going to take this array and in arrays, we have different different functions like push, pull, unshift, shift, all of these types of functions, right? So we're going to use the push function over here. So push function adds the number to the very last of our array. So array dot push and I'm going to say, I'm going to add basically both of our previous numbers. So we're at the index two, right? So we're going to add zero and first index to this. So we're going to say array of n minus one. So which is i minus one. And I'm going to add, oops, array of i minus two. And I think that should be it for us to populate this complete array with all of the Fibonacci series, right? So yeah, I think we can return. Let's just not return anything. I'm just going to console log and see what do we get in this array. I'm going to open my terminal and I'm just going to run Fibonacci.js. Oh, <laughs> again, I haven't called this my bad. So Fib and let's see. We get zero and one and I'm so stupid that I haven't provided this n over here. Let's just provide five. So we get zero, one, one, two, three, five. And this should be our final output, right? So I'm just gonna return or let's, let's console log array of n. So I'm gonna run this and yep, that is what we get. So I'm just gonna get rid of this console log and return, return this 
number so now obviously this is going to work if we have already tested it out so i'm just going to copy this up and provide it to the lead code and check how good this code actually is here we go we have opened fibonacci number uh, question over here it's 509 fibonacci number obviously i'm going to provide you the link to this question as well in the description down below so that you don't have to do the heavy work and i'm going to paste our solution over here let's submit this all right so this beats 98.78 percent of the solutions so it's already a very optimized solution and we have done a great job in writing the code for this awesome but obviously there's not just one single solution for every single question right so i'm gonna provide you another solution and i'm gonna introduce you to a new concept which you may or may not have heard of called recursion so i have this empty function over here again and you know what um I'm just going to comment this one out so that I can provide it to you in GitHub repository. So I'm just going to create const and now let's see. Let's compare it to our previous implementation. So first of all, what is this recursion anyway? Let's try to Google it. I'm going to go to over here. What is recursion? So it says that recursion occurs when the definition of a concept or process depending on simple. Okay, this is way too hard. Um, I'll, I'll, let's say recursion in JS. So recursion is a programming pattern or concept I mean, feature used in creating a function that keeps calling. Yeah, that this is this is helpful for us. Feature used in creating a function that keeps calling itself, but with a smaller input every consecutive time. Right. So over here, as you can see, they've given this example. So we have this function over here. We call this function inside of this function itself. So it calls this function. And, you know, in this case, it's obviously going to loop, loop till infinity. But uh, in our case, we're going to provide certain condition on when this function is going to be called again and when this is going to be terminated. So let's see if we have any other. Uh, uh, never mind. We're going to create our own example and I'm going to show you how it's done. So let's close this up. And yeah, so over here, first of all, we have this initial array with zero and one, right? So now, as you may recall, if it's the zeroth index, it's going to return a zero. If it's oneth index, it's going to return us one. So we're going to use this for our advantage. So I'm going, I'm just going to add a condition over here. If n is less than or equal to one, then obviously that is what is going to be our answer. So I'm going to say return n. If it's zero, return zero. If it's one, return one. Simple. But if that is not the case, then we're going to say return. That is if n is more than one, right? If it's two, then we're going to do our uh, calculation that uh, array one my i minus one and array i minus two. So that is what we're going to do over here. We're going to take previous two. So I'm going to call this function again, this fib function again over here. I'm going to call it and I'm going to say n minus one plus fib n minus 2 so let's understand what's happening over here if n is um let's say 3 if n is 3 over here so n equals 3 first of all it's gonna go inside it's gonna check okay it's not uh, less than or equal to 1 fine it's gonna go forward it's gonna go inside of this fib n minus 1 so fib n minus 1 which in this case is 2 so fib2 plus fib, in this case, it is fib3 uh, minus 2, 1. So this is what it's going to do. Now it's calling this function again. Now when it goes inside of this function, so I'm going to calculate this separately. Fib2. Now if it goes inside of this function again, what's happening? It's going to provide it 2. It's going to check. Okay, it's not less than or equal to 1. So it's going to go again over here. So it's going to call fib n minus 2. Now in this case, n minus 2 will be 0 plus fib n minus 1 is going to be 1. Now we already know what is going to be the output for these two. If it's fib 0 or fib 1, it's just going to return us the n, like 0 or 1. So this is going to return us 0. This is going to return us 1. So in this case, this will be 1. This will be our answer. So fib2 will give us 1. So I'm going to say 1 over here. Now fib1, in case of fib1, obviously we already know that fib1, if it's less than or equal to 1, it's going to return us 1. 
So this is going to return us one and our answer will be two over here. For n equals three, it's going to be two, right? So I think this should work. Let's try it out. I'm gonna log um, fib two, I mean fib two, just like that. And I'm gonna call it. And we get the, oh, oh my bad, I was supposed to do n equals three. Yeah, so now I'm gonna call it again. And yep, that is what our output is. And similarly, if it's a greater number like five or something like that, so you can follow the exact same dry run steps that I showed you over here by you know calling these functions again and again, just going into the depth of these questions. And don't worry if you're not able to understand recursion properly, I'm gonna bring you a complete video on recursion in my data structure series. And obviously that depends on you guys. If you guys comment down below and share this video as much as possible, only then I will know that you guys are having fun learning data structures from me. So I'm gonna just copy this uh, implementation now and again, go to lead code, provide it and submit it. And there you go, this works. And this beat 50, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't understand how this lead code works. Sometimes it would show like 90% for the same solution and sometimes it would show 50% or 60%. I have no idea. Uh, what my aim over here is to show you different, different solution that can be achieved for one single problem. So this is the recursive solution. And also I forgot to discuss this one. You can make it a one line solution as well. Just nothing. I've just uh, gotten rid of this if statement. I've added the term ternary operator over here. So n is less than or equal to one. Just return n, else return this. So this is much, much cleaner. Okay, now the next question is to find out if a number is a valid anagram or not. Now what the hell is this anagram? So anagram is a word or phase formed by rearranging the letter of a different word or a phase using all the original letter exactly one. So what does that mean? So in the input, we have two things. First, is this the original word, which is anagram? And then we have this other word called Nagaram, right? So we're supposed to tell if this other word is being made by rearranging the letters of this first word. If it's, if it, if it is the case, then this is going to be true. Then this is going to be an anagram number. So as you can see over here, we have this rat and then we have this car. So obviously this is not made by rearranging the letters of rat, right? Because it has T and this has extra C. So obviously this is not an anagram word, right? So that is what we're supposed to do in this question. We're supposed to write a logic which takes two things. One is the original uh, word and the other is the original word or a phase. And we're supposed to tell if it's an anagram number or not. So cool, we're gonna create a function over here. Const is anagram. And I'm gonna take two things, s comma t. Now we're gonna first learn the very, very simple, very ground level simple approach. So what my plan over here is, I'm just gonna take the first number anagram and I'm gonna take the other number, Sinaga Ram. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna sort these numbers. If these numbers are made exactly by using uh, the same letters, then these are going to be sorted in the exact same fashion. So it's going to give us something which is exactly the same as the other one. Then we can compare both of these. And if they are same, then obviously this is an anagram, right? So I'm just gonna say s equals s dot split. So do you remember I just uh, talked about this split function in our first question? So in the palindrome question, so we're supposed to split this to make this an array. So if we're gonna split this, this is going to become a, uh, in the string format, a, you just assume that these are string, right? I'm not gonna provide the braces to each and every one of them. So this is going to convert it into uh, an array, right? So this is where that's why we're using the split. And now when this is converted into an array, we have a function called sort in our array, which sorts them in the ascending order. So if I say sort, this just simply be sorted in an ascending order. So I'm assuming this will be like a comma a, comma a. So this is what it should look like when sorted. And now what we're gonna simply do, we're gonna join it. So that also we're gonna join it by the empty string. So it's gonna convert it, be converted into a, 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 m, n, r. 
and that is exactly what will happen over here as well but in this case obviously it's going to be just like that so it's going to be an array like this and then it's going to be sorted and then it's going to be joined so these two are exactly the same so now we can compare these so what i'm going to duplicate it instead of s i will just say t now it is reversed again and now i'm going to return if s equals to t and i think that should be good enough let's take this and throw it into the lead code and check it out so i'm just going to replace it over here and submit this all right this is amazing so this is this has ran successfully and uh, as you can see but this is so, this is a pretty slow solution it beats only 36 percent of the other solution so we're gonna just try to go ahead and optimize this problem so that we can make this code a little bit fast so i'm just gonna comment it out um comment say first approach now i'll take the exact same function and try to create another approach i'm gonna keep this example up here so that you can refer to this also i'd like to mention that uh, instead of doing this separately taking this uh, in a separate line you can just do this triple equals to this so it, it's gonna become basically one liner right so that is if you're so if you want to write it in a clean way now for our second solution now for those of you if you are new to js first of all i hope you're not new to js but if you are then i'm gonna do this second solution by using something called objects in javascript if you don't know what object is you can watch this video that i've created on objects link will be in the description down below but even if you don't have any knowledge about objects don't worry i'm gonna explain it briefly in this video as well so first of all since we are supposed to make this a fast solution an optimized solution so we're gonna check the edge cases first as you may remember i mentioned edge cases are very important so i'm gonna check so let's let's throw the obvious out of the window so if these two strings doesn't have the same amount of length that i mean same length then obviously this is not an anagram right because how will it be anagram if it's not using all of the letters or the alphabets of the original string so i'm just gonna say if s dot length if it's not equal to t dot length then obviously we're gonna return false it's not an anagram that's pretty ground level logic now i'm going to define two objects over here object one so object is like if it's a, if you're coming from some other programming language objects are basically like map i mean we have map in javascript as well but let's talk let's talk about that sometime else but these are exactly like map we can map key value pairs in these objects and i'm going to show you how so I'm going to define two objects over here and below that I'm going to run a for loop uh, and I'm just going to explain you what my strategy is going to be in just a second. So this for loop will start from zero and go to s dot length it can be t dot length or s dot length doesn't really matter because they both are same length right. So what I'm going to do over here. I'm going to take these objects. So I'm going to take the first object and I will say I'll take um, these letters one by one. So I will take a first. So it's going to be key and I'm going to say it appears one time in this string. Let's take a small example. Now let's say I'll take rat and uh, tar example. I think these both are valid uh, words. So I'll just say r appears one time in this and a appears one time in this and uh, t appears one time in this and similarly i'm just gonna map it for the other object as well right so it it will also give us the same thing and obviously objects doesn't have any you know sequence to be defined so we can access objects from any single sequence i'm, I'm just gonna discuss that in i mean just a minute let me just uh, write this out first so t a and r so we have all both of these objects made over here now we can iterate through one of these objects and pick let's say r we're gonna take this r we're gonna check okay r appears one time in this object and we're gonna access r okay r appear one time in this object as well then cool that that works we're gonna move forward we're gonna check for a let's say if a were to appear two times and over here as well two times so we're gonna check okay these both are also same and then we're gonna check for t okay that is also same 
then obviously this is an anagram word or anagram string so this is what our strategy is going to be so i'm gonna go inside of this for loop now i'm just gonna say obj1 so first of all we are supposed to create these objects right we don't have these objects defined just yet so i'm just gonna create this also for obj1 i'm gonna say i'm gonna take the first string obviously the s i'll take the first character of this string or you know ith character of this string that is in this case will be let's see if it's if we're taking anagram so this is going to be a right so obj of a this is going to be the key and we're going to provide it now the value so the value of a will be one so this appears one time in this string and similarly is what we're going to do for t as well so for the first for the first character that is n it's going to take n and it's going to say one but what if we encounter n again in this so as you can see is in this case we have a a and a so if this for loop goes forward in this string and it encounters another a then it's going to overlap this uh, one right because that is how object works if if it's uh, you know if it's one then it's going to again access a eighth key oh, what is a eighth key so it's going to it's going to access the a key and it's gonna provide it the one again but that is not be what we want right we want to access this key and we're gonna add it if it appears again we're gonna make it two over here right so that is what we're going to do so over here i'm gonna say this whatever the value of this is just add one to it but in the first case there's going to be no value right so i'm just gonna say if there is value just provide it this or just provide it zero so that is what we're gonna do for here as well i of i mean t of i so after this we're gonna have both of these objects made now after that we're gonna loop through this complete both of these objects and we're going to refer if it's an anagram or not i'm gonna use a for loop actually for in loop so for in loop looks something like this get rid of that so if we're supposed to loop through an object we're gonna take each and every key of that object so in this case the object is obj1 oh i should have written obj2 over here yeah that's fine so i'm gonna take obj1 now i'm gonna say if so this will basically loop through all of the keys of the object so i'm gonna say if obj1 key so this is how we can access it so it's gonna take r first so if we say obj1 of r it's gonna give us one in this case so if obj1 key is not equal to the same key we're gonna provide it to obj2 so obj2 key so if it's not equal to that then instantly we're gonna terminate the loop because obviously if this r doesn't exist in this other object or it has a different value then why would we move forward and compare the other ones right so i'm just gonna simply terminate it so return false yeah, i think that is what we need to do if if this runs successfully if this moves forward after this then obviously this is an anagram right this did, if it didn't fail then we're gonna say return true and i think that should be good enough let's open our terminal and try to run this also i'm supposed to call this so is anagram i'm gonna provide both of these anagram and the other one just like that um yeah okay let's try to run this the third one okay i haven't console logged so log here let's try to run this now it's true if i remove one a from this this is going to be false false awesome so this is how you can do okay <laughs> we haven't uh, you know taken validation from lead code yet so let's go to the lead code and let's take the validation for our code and there you go this beats 91.3 percent of the other solutions so that is an amazing solution that we have just written over here and see this is the difference between time complexities of a good code and a not so good code 
and also i would like to mention one thing that both of these answers are correct right you can use any logic to do it because majorly in front end interviews i don't think people consider speed of algorithms that much because javascript is slow compared to c and c++ and also obviously if you provide a solution with a really really bad time complexity for a question like this that is not acceptable but in our case both of these answers are correct because both of these answers can be used in real world as well right you can use split sort and you know reverse all of these functions in real world while building your front end app right therefore what matters most is you provide a solution which can be used in the real world even if it's not that much optimized that's fine it shouldn't be the really bad solution right like you are uh, inserting nested loops one inside of the other then it's going to have n square time complexity and i know a lot of you won't understand this uh, time complexity of o of n o of n square don't worry i'm the first video of my data structures with javascript series will be on time complexities and i'm going to explain you what time complexity is what space complexity is and how we can calculate and we can we, we won't need lead code at that point we can ourselves calculate the time complexity of a one of a particular solution if it's a good solution or if it's a bad solution now our next question is to sum so what this question says that we have been given an array of integers nums and an integer target as you can see just like that return the indices of two numbers such that they add up to a target so let me give you an example so we have all of these numbers 2 7 11 15 then we have this target 9 now we have to identify two such numbers over here which add up to 9 so in this case we have 2 and 7 2 plus 7 equals to 9 so in the output we are supposed to provide the location or the index of these inside of the array so this is 0th index and this is 1th index so it's going to be the output 0 comma 1 because as you can see i have written over here because nums of 0 plus nums of 1 equals to 9 so we return 0 comma 1 similarly in our second example we have 3 2 and 4 as the array and the target is 6 so it can be 2 plus 4 is going to be the output 1th index and the second index so output is 1 comma 2 so that is what this question says so let's see how we can do that so first of all what i would like to mention with this question is that uh, this is kind of an intermediate level question and some tip sometimes people just want to provide the most optimized solution for a question like this but as you may have heard others say this as well that you are supposed to create a solution first doesn't matter if it's a really bad solution you are supposed to first create any solution first then try to go and step by step optimizing that particular question right so we're going to use something called brute force approach so what brute force approach is it in that approach we try to come up with all of the solution that can exist like for example we're going to add 3 plus 2 3 plus 4 2 plus 4 and all of these solutions that can exist like we're going to add all of these we're going to take two numbers from this array every possible combination and we're going to try to add them together then when we have all of these combinations then we're going to check okay this is the combination that has you know been added like 3 plus 2 and it it has created 6 so this is what our answer is so that is what we're going to use first so i'm just going to say brute force solution so now i'm going to create a function called to sum and i'm going to take an anonymous function as usual and this takes two things nums and our target so yeah so what was our plan that we're going to create all of the possible combination for this array right so i'm going to give you an example over here so that we can visualize it better so if we have to Three and two and four. So let's see how many combinations this can have. So this can have three plus two. This can have three plus four. We can have two plus four. Yeah, I think that that is all that we can have in this uh, one. Similarly, if we take this, this can have obviously much more solutions. So in this, we can identify. Okay, three plus two is what adding to make. Oh, now in this case, we can identify. Okay, six is the one that we're supposed to check. which was 2 plus 4 that is 2 and 4 1 and 2 so that is what our output is going to be so let's let's go inside of this i'm going to run a for loop it's going to go to nums dot length uh, so it's going to start from 0 and it's going to 
nums dot length. We're gonna iterate through the complete array. Now inside of this, we're gonna see. We're gonna start with this number, right? So we're gonna take three. Let me let me take a uh, better example. I'm gonna take this one. I'm gonna start with two, right? Then we're gonna take all possible combinations of two. So two plus seven, two plus eleven. 2 plus 15 and then we're going to start with 7 so 7 plus 11 7 plus 15 and so on so for that we're obviously going to be needing two loops one loop which is going to loop through the first number that which is going to be our primary number so 2 7 11 15 and then the second loop which will loop after that primary number so if 2 is selected so it's the other loop will run from 7 to 15 if 7 is selected it's going to run from 11 to 15 and so on Right, so that is what we're going to do over here. So first loop is what is going to run for the primary number, and the other loop, call it J, and it's going to start from obviously it's going to start from the primary number, right? So primary number plus one. So I plus one. It's going to start from I plus one and it's going to go to the very end. So nums dot length. Right? So we have two loops over here. Now we're supposed to write our logic inside of over here. So what is the logic? It's pretty simple. We're gonna take both the i and the j and we're gonna add it. So I'm gonna say if nums of i plus nums of j, if it's equal to our target, then we're gonna return both of the index of those i comma j. And I think this should give us our final answer. So let's take this. And let me just try to run this first so that I don't screw up over there to some. And let's just give it these two input, the array and the target, which is nine. Now I'm gonna open up our terminal node to some dot js. And yep, that is what is expected from this one. So the, yep, that, that works. I'm just going to take this and provide it to lead code. Let's submit this. I think this will have really bad time complexity. Okay. So this beats around 50% of the other solutions. So not bad. Okay. We're going to try to optimize it further. Okay. Now for our second approach, let's use JavaScript objects again and try to optimize this. So I'm going to say using JS objects. And I'll say const to sum. I'm going to create another object. It's going to take both of those things, nums and target. And we're going to write, write the logic inside of it. Now, trust me, this solution is going to be very easy and it might even blow your mind. It's possible it might not blow your mind as well, right? So I'm just going to take uh, an object over here, an empty object. So what we're going to simply do over here, Let's understand the logic first. So we have uh, this array, right? I'm just gonna simply say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna create an object. Okay, so over here, we're gonna take the first thing that is nums equals two. I'm gonna assign it as a key to our object, right? And now we're gonna check if this two that is inside of the array, if we reduce it from this target nine, which is going to be in this case seven, right? Does this exist inside of the array or not? minus 2 equals 7. So does 7 exist in this array? But let's say if that was not the case, if uh, let's say target was 26. So in this case, the, this would not be the case, right? So 26 minus 2 will be 24, which doesn't exist inside of our array. So we're not going to return anything. And we're simply going to provide this an index, which is the original index, which is 0. Now, why, why are we doing this? You're gonna understand in just a second. Now, again, for our second number, that is seven, that is not the case. So 26 minus seven will be 19. It doesn't exist inside of the array. So I'm just gonna provide it the index and move forward. Now for the third one, that is 11. 11 for 11, let's see. I'm gonna say 11, sorry, 26 minus 11 is going to be 15. 15 does exist inside of the array but we haven't encountered it yet. So I'm just gonna simply assign this position to 11, which is two. 
Now, when we reach 15, we're going to check 26 minus 15 is going to be 11. So does 11 already exist inside of our object? Yes, it does. And in which position? It exists in the second position. So I'm going to say 15th position is 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to say 2, comma 3. So this is what our final output is going to be. Because as I already mentioned that we have already stored this position inside this object, right? So we can just directly take it from there. So we can, you know, say something like, uh, let's call it our OBJ object and we can provide it 11. So 11th position is 2, comma, the 15th position is 3. So OBJ of 11, comma 3, which is 2, comma 3. So this is what our final output is going to be. So, okay, let's, let's try to write the logic for it. I, I know it might be a little bit confusing, but don't worry. I'm just going to try to explain it. So I will start a for loop from I. It will go to nums, obviously. Inside of it, I'm just going to take the current one. So n equals nums of i. So I've just taken the current number, which is 2 in this case. So I've just taken it inside of this. And now I'm going to check if obj target minus n. So n was 2. So I'm going to check if target, which is 9, minus 2, which is 7, does it exist inside of our object or not? By doing this obj and providing it inside of this square bracket, we are trying to find if it exists inside of this object or not. Because if it does exist, it's going to provide us the position, right? So if it if we get the position, so it's obviously going to be more than or equal to zero, right? If we do manage to find it, so we're gonna just return as we you know discussed over here. We're gonna say obj and target minus n comma the current one that is ith index so i and that is it so if if it exists then that's the case but if what if it doesn't exist then we were providing the position to it right so else if it doesn't exist so i'm going to say obj of n that is for the current number we're going to provide it the i position and i think that is it let's try to run this so i'm going to say log to sum and let's take this comma 26 and yep we get 2 comma 3 as expected cool let's just take this uh, solution and provide it to lead code let's see how much improvement have we actually made so go back and submit it and there you have it. We have beaten 93.60% of the solutions for this problem. That is an amazing optimization for this two sum problem. Now the next question is best time to buy and sell stocks. Now I'm damn sure you must have heard about this question from somewhere because this is a really, really popular problem. And this is even asked in huge tech companies like Amazon, Apple, Meta, etc. So now you need to give your 100% focus to me to understand this problem because this is a very, very important problem. So the question says that you are given an array prices where prices of I is the price of a given stock. So we have all of this prices inside of this array. So this array basically consists of stock prices on a particular day. So let's say seven is the, we can consider it, uh, I don't know, let's say rupee. We can consider it 7 rupee on Monday, 1 rupee on Tuesday, 5 rupee on Wednesday, and so on. So it says that you want to maximize your profit by choosing a single day to buy one stock and choosing a different day in future to sell that stock so that we can maximize the profit, right? So that means that we are supposed to buy a stock and then we are supposed to sell it so that we earn most amount of money, right? So let's say, for example, if we buy at 1, and we sell at six, then we would earn about five rupees. And as you can see, the output is five. And obviously you can't just buy one day and sell a day before, right? That is not how real world works. I mean, this is also not how the real world works that you have the complete data of the complete week. And you, okay, you just decide I'm gonna buy on Tuesday and I'm gonna sell on Thursday. If that was the case, then everyone would be a millionaire. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, that is what we're supposed to do, right? So we're supposed to code a logic so that we can identify our maximum profit in this scenario. 
Also, it says if you cannot achieve any profit, just return zero, right? Because if we, let's say, if we had an array like seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, so stock price is getting decreased every day, right? So how can you make the profit? So you're not supposed to make any profit in this scenario. So that is when you have to return zero. So, okay, let's, let's try to jump straight into the solution. First of all, as I always like to do, I'm going to first try to create a brute force solution. Brute force solution, as I mentioned, are not the most optimized solution, but is is a solution anyways. So we are supposed to first come up with one solution and then try to optimize it for a better solution. So I'm going to create a function over here called max profit. And I'm going to take prices as the param in this because this is what is going to be this array, right? So in this solution, what we will try to do, we will try to calculate every single possible combination that there is of buying and selling a stock. So we're going to buy at seven, we're going to sell at one, we're going to buy at seven, we're going to sell at five, we're going to buy at seven, we're going to sell at three. And the same for one as well, we're going to buy at one, we're going to sell at five. So this way we will have all of the different possible combinations that uh, either we can achieve a profit or we can achieve a loss on. So then when we have all of these combinations, then we can just choose whatever the maximum profit is, right? So let's try to write a logic for this. So I'm going to take a variable called global profit and I'm going to assign it to zero. Now after this, since we are supposed to calculate every single possible combination, we're going to use the same technique that we used in our previous question. That is, we're going to run two loops. One will be iterating through each and every one of these and the other one will be iterating through all of the elements after it, right? So I'm going to take a for loop which will start from zero and it will go to prices dot length. Now inside of this for loop, actually this is going to go to prices dot length minus one because when we reach six, then we are supposed to iterate through four, right? But when we reach four, then we have nothing uh, after it. So we are not supposed to go here anyways. So, so that is why we are going to prices dot length minus one that is until here. So now inside of it, we are supposed to create another loop, which will iterate from all of the elements after it, like from this to this, right? So I'm going to get a for loop and it's going to start from, can you guess from where? Let me just write it down, remove this. So since it's starting from zero, this is going to start from where I is currently. So I'm just going to write I over here and actually I plus one over here, because if I is at seven, so I'm going to start from one, right? So I plus one. So J will start from I plus one and it will go to prices dot length. And I think, yeah, that, that is it. Now I'm going to write my logic inside of it. So I think that's pretty straightforward. See, we have this and we have this. Now what we're going to do, we're going to just minus this from this. So const current profit will be prices of J minus prices of i so we have the current profit with us right now and now we are going to compare it with our global profit if it's more than global profit then we're gonna you know assign this value to global profit because that is the maximum profit that we have encountered up until this point right so that is what i'm gonna write over here so if current profit is more than global profit then global profit is equal to current profit yeah i guess that that is what we're supposed to do and i think that is it let's let's try to run this oh we are supposed to return um, global profit as well yeah so i'm gonna say max profit and actually i'm gonna write it inside of a console log terminal and i'm gonna say node and run this so we get five as our output that is what we expected Let's try to run this and we should get zero because obviously there is no profit to be made over here, right? So, yep, we get zero. Awesome. Now let's take this solution of ours and go to lead code and I'm going to paste it over here. Let's submit this. <laughs> oh my God. So this solution was so bad that it couldn't even identify the you know it, it couldn't even incorporate it in the time limit that was provided to us damn so this was a really really bad solution it has a really bad time complexity that the time limit itself got exceeded
Well, let's try to optimize it then. We're gonna create an optimized solution and we're gonna use an algorithm called greedy algorithm. Now I won't confuse you with these terminologies. We will understand this greedy algorithm along with other different types of algorithm in my in-depth TSA course, which as you already know, depends on you. If you guys share this video a lot, if this video gets a really good response, then I will obviously create a complete DSA series for absolutely free over here on YouTube. So let's move forward and understand this. So uh, basically greedy algorithm, what it says is, it means that we are going to calculate our solution with whatever we have right now. So let me just show you with an example. Let me just create a, a function over here, max profit function, normal function with prices. Right, so let's try to understand the logic what we're gonna use. I'm just gonna take this array and I'm gonna paste it over here. So first of all, we're gonna go at seven and we're gonna assume that this is the minimum stock price amongst all of these, right? So that is what we're gonna do. First of all, we're gonna go to seven and we're gonna assume that is the minimum stock. And up until this point, our profit is zero. So we're gonna have two things. Our minimum stock is seven and our profit is zero, right? So now we're gonna move forward one step. So when we move forward from this one step ahead, we encountered one over here. So first of all, we will notice, is this more than the minimum stock price or less than the minimum stock price? If it's less than the minimum stock price, then obviously this is the one that we should be using to calculate our profit, right? Because if we try to do one minus seven, so to calculate profit, that is when we are going to replace this minimum with one now. So our minimum is one. But since this is a greedy algorithm, as the name suggests, we are going, we are still going to calculate the profit with whatever resources that we have currently. So as the question said, if there is no profit, just return zero. So right now there was no profit, right? It was minus six. So we're gonna return zero again. So ultimately this profit is still zero, right? So, okay, no worries. But now we know that the minimum stock price is one, not seven. So let's, let's move forward. So we encounter five over here. Now five is more than one. So obviously we are getting profit over here and this is not less than one. So we won't update this minimum variable. So I'm just gonna say five minus one to be four. So right now the max profit is four. Up until this point in this question, our max profit is four. Cool, now let's move forward. We encounter three. So still three is not less than one, right? So we will not update our minimum stock value. But since we are greedy, we are going to calculate it again. So it's three minus one, which is two. But see, two is not more than our current profit. So we are just going to reject two. We are not going to take the two, even though we became greedy and calculated the profit, but this is not helpful to us. So I'm just gonna reject it straight away. So still we are at four and the minimum value of the stock is still at one. Now we are at six. Okay, six is still not less than one. Cool, so we're not going to replace that. But since we are greedy, we are going to calculate this. Six minus one to be five. Now five is more than four. So our new profit is five now. We're just gonna reject this old profit and currently our current profit has become five. Now we're gonna move forward again. We encounter four. Okay, four is still not less than one. So we're not gonna update one and since we are greedy, we're gonna calculate four minus one, four minus one, which will give us three. And three is not more than five, so we're not going to consider this case of three. So we're gonna remove that. So this is how we will calculate our output, which is five in this case. So let's see how we can do this in our code. So as I mentioned, we're gonna take two things, minimum uh, stock value variable and a profit variable. So I'm gonna say let, minimum stock uh, or I'll say minimum stock purchase price, right? And I'm gonna assume that this is the very first one. As I mentioned, we're gonna assume it to be the seventh because that is what we have at this moment to work with. Either it can be seven or it can be zero if there's nothing there. And I'm gonna take our maximum profit to be zero right now, right? Initially, we, we didn't have any profit, so we're gonna assume it to be zero. Now, I'm gonna run a for loop to run through all of these different stocks. So I will say I 
me just uh, remove this. So I will start from one, right? Because obviously we have the value of seven with me. So it will start from uh, one and it will go to prices dot length. And so what was our first step? Whenever we encounter a next stock, what were we doing? We were first identifying, is it less than the current price of the minimum stock? Let's check if prices is less than minimum stock purchase price. If that's the case, then the minimum stock purchase price will be prices of I. Cool, that is done. But after that, since we are using greedy algorithm, we're gonna calculate profit every single time. So I will say profit to be, let current profit to be prices of I minus whatever the minimum stock price was, minimum stock purchase price. And now I'm gonna compare it with our global profit, right? So I will say math dot max. So this basically this function is used to calculate which amongst these is maximum value. So as you can see over here, we are supposed to provide values and returns the larger of a set of supplied numerical expressions, numeric expressions. So if I say profit, that is this profit, which is zero right now, and say comma, this current profit. So it's going to return us whatever is maximum between these two. And you know what, I'll just take this, get rid of this, and I'll replace it over here, just like that. And it will give us the maximum profit amongst this. And that is how it's going to loop through this complete array. And it's going to give us this five at the end or whatever the profit, the maximum profit is at the end. So I'll just say return profit. And I think that should be good enough for us to test this out. So I'll say console log, oh, console log max profit. And I will provide this with this array. Let's open the terminal and try to run this. We get zero. Hmm. Why is that the case? Oh, my bad. <laughs> I just put this uh, array bracket over here. I have to close it at this place. So now I think this should work. If I try to run this, yeah, we can see all of the profit that we get at every single iteration. So I'm gonna remove this console log and yeah, we get this output as five, the final answer. So just to check, I'm gonna run this again. Yep, we get this final answer. And I'm gonna check this with this as well. And yep, we get zero. Cool, let's just take it and run it in lead code. I'm just gonna write uh, greedy algorithm. Yeah. Cool, let's try to replace this and hopefully this will run, at least run this time. So let's submit this. And our solution beats 46.68% of the other solutions. Awesome. Now, obviously there's still a room for improvement in this problem, but I'm gonna leave this right over here. And I'm gonna urge you to try this out because I'm going to discuss this problem along with all of the other problems in depth and I'm going to give you best possible solution in my DSA course. If you guys happen to like this video right now. And also if you're not that good in JavaScript and you want to understand all of the concept in depth, I've created a complete JavaScript series that you can watch by clicking on this video over here.